Well, good evening and welcome to opening worship. It is our joy to have you here. My name is Arthur Jones. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Andrew. And it is our joy to welcome you uh, here, both online and in person, to our opening worship. And so on behalf of St. Andrew, who will be hosting this annual conference, We have had two years of hosting annual conference and they have both looked very different, but it is our joy and our privilege to host as we begin worship. Thanks for being here. Let us stand up and join us and worship God. It is a wonderful thing when members of the family live together in love and peace. They shall be treated like partners. May the church be one, just as Christ and God are one, that Christ may be glorified in us. They shall yield good fruits in a season, and their leaves shall never wither. The grace, mercy, and peace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And also with you. Let us and worship God.
Please remain standing for our affirmation of faith. Together, we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live in respect with creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified, risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, beyond, beyond death, God is with us, we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I now invite you to read along, remembering who we are. Let us remember together. We, the people called United Methodists, affirm our faith in God, our Creator and Father, in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in the Holy Spirit, our guide and guide. Dependence upon God in birth, in life, in death, and in life eternal. Securing God's love, we affirm the goodness of life and confess our many sins against God's will for us, as we find it in Jesus Christ. We have not always been faithful stewards of all that has been committed to us by God the Creator. We have been reluctant followers of Jesus Christ in his mission to bring all persons into a community of love. Though called by the Holy Spirit to become new creatures in Christ, we have resisted the first further call to become the people of God in our dealings with each other and the earth on which we live. We affirm our unity in Jesus Christ while acknowledging differences in applying our faith in different cultural contexts as we live out the gospel. We stand united in declaring our faith that God's grace is available to all, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Grateful for God's forgiving love in which we live and by which we are judged and affirming our belief in the inestimable worth of each individual we renew our commitment to become faithful witnesses to the gospel, not alone to the ends of earth, but also to the depths of our common life and work. The image, image you have shaped, shaped within, within us, mysteriously, incredibly, a reflection of your own being, is best seen in the multiple refractions of our variegated humanity. The prismatic kaleidoscope. The prismatic kaleidoscope. In the prismatic kaleidoscope. The prismatic kaleidoscope of, of our, our shared life, life our, our interconnectedness. interconnectedness our, our being, being with, with each, each other. other. We seek you, God. We long for you. And thankfully, you are not far off. Not hidden. We, we need, need only remember, remember that, that you, you are, are most easily found when, when we, we find you together. together. And, and when we are humble enough to look, look even in, in the faces we, we find most strange, and, and unfamiliar.
Let us pray. Holy and loving God, again we have gathered together to begin an annual conference in North Texas. As is our tradition and our custom, O oh God, we have gathered as clergy and laity. But there is something different this year that we have done. That some of us have gathered in place in this sanctuary, while many others are worshiping with us virtually. We hope, O oh God, that our choices that we have made over these past several months have been pleasing in your sight. As together, as a people of God, we have sought to do no harm during this season of a pandemic that has lasted so long and which have claimed so many lives. We're grateful, O oh God, for our clergy and our laity and our churches in North Texas and the way in which they have continued to serve you and to serve those within their communities by offering the light of Christ, by a significant word, even virtually on a Sunday morning at other time of the week, or simply by a very simple act of mercy. Oh God, we have all sought to do that which is pleasing and to do that which is created good. We are grateful for this time together this evening as we do worship. And we know that the Spirit moves throughout those who are present here with you tonight, either at St. Andrews or virtually. We know that there will be a rekindling perhaps even of your will and our own lives and that you will challenge us in new and unique ways. We're grateful for Bishop Gregory Vaughn Palmer who will bring the word this night for the witness that he will share. We're grateful that he can be with us virtually and sharing with us about what love does, has got to do with it. And so God, as we continue this worship, continue to kindle in our hearts a fire for your mission. For it's the name of the risen Christ that I pray on behalf of all the people of North Texas. And together we say, Amen. Because of my knowledge of God's true secret, I have been made to suffer. But don't be discouraged. My suffering brings honor to you. So I bow in prayer before the Father. Good start. Humble-ish. Yes. Let them see we're one of them. Okay, yeah. But remember, we're the authority. We've seen Christ with our own eyes. Yes, we're teaching them. Every family in heaven and on earth gets its true name from God. So the Father, in his great love, gives you a strong spirit. Be careful. We don't want to talk down to them. They're not children. But they are children. How many letters have we sent them telling them the truth? but they fight amongst themselves over who believes the right way, who worships the right way. I'm gonna lose it. All right, all right, all right. Just, let's calm down for a minute. Look, let's just hold on to ourselves here. We don't want to lose sight of the goal. <sighs> okay, here we go. I pray that Christ will live in your hearts and that your lives will have deep roots in love, a firm foundation on which to build. I pray 
that you and all God's holy people will come to understand the greatness of Christ's love and to know how wide, how high, how long, and how deep that love is. Now we're cooking. Yes, draw them in. Yeah, then drop the hammer and close the deal. Easy. Take it easy. We don't want to scare them off. But they have to know how important this is. Their very souls hang in the balance. We're not messing around here. This is the truth. Yes, you're right, you're right. But let's try to love them into it. Huh? Open the door. Invite them in. Christ's love is greater than anyone can possibly know, beyond our human comprehension. But even so, I pray with all my heart that you will know that love. Then you will know God. And with that love working in us, God can do so much more than we can possibly ask or even imagine. Glory to God and Christ forever and ever. Amen. Nice. That's it. Really beautiful, guys. Psst, psst. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs>
Tonight, it's a pleasure to introduce to you my good friend who is with us virtually, who will be preaching and bringing the word this evening, Bishop Gregory Vaughn Palmer. Bishop Palmer is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is a son of the church, literally. His father was a pastor in Philadelphia at Tinley Temple. And Bishop Palmer is a graduate of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. and Duke Divinity School. And following that education, he went to East Ohio Annual Conference where he served for a number of years until he was elected a bishop. He served as a local church pastor and as district superintendent and was elected to the Episcopacy, I believe, in the year 2000. Bishop Palmer is one of the most creative preachers in our church today. He always brings a very good word. He also speaks not only from just his heart, but from the deepest part of his soul. Being able to wed together both social mercy and justice and piety. He's the way in which probably he is a complete package as a communicator. He's been with the clergy of the North Texas Conference before at a clergy day uh, a year and a half ago, in which he shared with us that day on the work of what it means to do anti-racism work using the baptismal vows as a guide for that. It's my pleasure to introduce to you one of my very good friends and a trusted advisor, mentor, and counselor, Bishop Palmer. And we will hear him after the reading of the text from Ephesians. Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpass knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. To Bishop and Mrs. McKee and to all of you who are the members and leaders of the North Texas Annual Conference, grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ. I count it a great honor to be with you via this digital medium, and I am grateful that your bishop and my friend Bishop McKee preached for the West Ohio Annual Conference, which we just adjourned a few days ago, using the same medium and technology. Thank you, Bishop McKee, for doing that and for the many ways that we have partnered in ministry, and most of all, for your friendship. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Grant, O oh, eternal one, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may find in acceptance in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in North Texas, your theme for this annual conference session, Rooted in Love, has already been a blessing to me. It is mostly because I can't stop humming and singing. And I confess to you that I go back and forth and all around humming or singing or reciting the words of songs that may be referred to as so-called sacred and other songs that come from the larger culture that is outside the church and yet 
in many ways is fully a part of the church. Just a moment ago when I prayed, I used a hymn. I used the poetic words of that Scottish preacher, George Matheson, in his hymn entitled, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. This pastor preacher who began losing his sight at age 15 and was totally blind, I'm told, by age 18, speaks of the writing of this hymn and says that it came to him out of great anguish and suffering. There can only be and has only been speculation about the details of that anguish or of that suffering. But one of the stories I heard early on as a young preacher and pastor had to do with him having a deep love relationship with a young woman that he believed would be his wife, as the story goes. But ultimately, she severed the bond. She walked away. She ended the relationship because it was difficult for her to imagine being with someone for the rest of her life who was not physically sighted. When she broke or walked away from that relationship, so to speak, his response, according to this tale, was to look to God and to cry out and to seek assurance from God and in God that God's love never leaves us never forsakes us. God's love never walks away. God's love never cuts the tie. God's love never severs the cord. We may never know for sure the precise genesis of Matheson's words, but we cannot miss the meaning of them. His was a cry of both anguish and assurance mixed together with a declaration or an affirmation of faith. And he declared in this hymn, God's love will never let us go with magnificent and soaring poetry. How could it, my friends, that is, how could God's love ever let us go when indeed creation itself is, from a theological perspective, an act of love? Our very human existence bespeaks the love of God if you read the narrative in Genesis. And if you listen to the poetic interpretation of James Weldon Johnson, who in his volume entitled God's Trombones, has seven sermons coming out of the African-American church and preaching tradition that he has put in magnificent verse and in his piece called The Creation. There is this scene after God has spoken the world into being. God has declared there to be light. God has uh, created all parts of the creation. And then James Weldon Johnson depicts God anthropologically sitting down on a side of a hill, the poetry says, where God could think. And then the poet goes on to say that God held God's head in God's hand. And out of his own loneliness, it says, he thought and he thought and he thought. And then he said, I'll make human kind. Can you imagine? How could God ever cut the cord with us when we exist out of God's love and God's imaginativeness and God's yearning for community? To be in relationship, not only with the fullness of God's self, which we can never completely conceive, but to be in communion and community with other aspects of God's creation of which we are a part. What's more, not only are we created all along with the rest of creation out of God's heart and out of God's love and out of God's largesse, <laughs> But we are sustained by God's love even in our brokenness with all, as one preacher said, of our derelictions and delinquencies where we stray from the heart of God's love. Everything that we know about God 
especially if we read the biblical record. And when we think about our own relationship with God, individually and collectively, suggests to us that God's love is pure, it's unadulterated, it is relentless. God is in relentless pursuit of us because God desires relationship. And even when we have gone astray, God seeks to be in relationship with us. And God bids us turn to God again. God bids us, if you take some of the biblical images, come home, find your heart in God again. We are God's creation. God created us out of love, and God's love for us will never be revoked. I referred earlier to my inability to think about the theme of love and not find myself singing or humming or reciting the words of some song, either out of the Christian faith tradition or out of a larger cultural experience. And sometimes the songs of the larger culture speak to us of love or dare I say, of the failure to love or of unrequited love or of love that seems elusive. Just as effectively as some of the hymns of the faith, though they may not reference God. But also these songs about love from the larger culture speak to us of the risk of love and the vulnerability of love. And maybe that is what we fear we will experience being at risk if we love, being vulnerable if we love, being exposed if we love. If we open our hearts to other, the others, there is the risk that they will be broken, we will be hurt. If we are generous with others, there is the risk that we may not receive generosity in return. Is that what Tina Turner was saying? as I have seized upon her famous song, which I have used as the title of this homily, what's love got to do with it? Can you hear her? She says, you must understand how the touch of your hand makes my pulse react, that it's only the thrill of a boy meeting girl, opposites attract, it's physical, only logical. You must try to ignore that it means more than that. Oh, oh, what's love got to do with it? What's love, she queries, but a secondhand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? If you and I were to exegete in community this song, she's saying a lot, both at the surface and beneath the surface, about the nature of love, about the risk of love, about vulnerability, about our natural physical needs and inclinations in or out of love. But she raises the question about encounters between people who would be lovers. What's love got to do with it? As the Christian community, we have a response and an answer to that called covenant and relationship and sometimes marriage. <laughs> but Tina Turner, out of her own experience, I mean, I understand this is popular music and that there is a financial motive as well, but often we sing our joys as well as our pains. And her question continues, what's love got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? Who needs a heart? when a heart can be broken. Or may I turn to the songs of Roberta Flack and Donnie Hathaway? Again, in the form of a question, they say six times, five times, where is the love? Where is the love? And then in the verses, you said you give to me as soon as you were free. Will it ever be? Where is the love? You told me that you didn't love him and you were going to say goodbye, but if you really didn't mean it, why did you have to lie? And Hathaway and Flack come back again 
and they keep asking over and over and over and over and over again of this song, where is the love? These two songs speak of frustrations, shall we say, of personal and romantic love. They speak of the desire for relationship, but feeling that either trust has been broken or I should never give my heart in trust again. These feelings are not left only to us in personal, one-on-one -on -one kind of romantic relationships. They come up in our friendships. They come up in our working relationships. Even in the church, have we not heard people cry out in a moment of frustration when there has been enmity and strife? Where is the love? And oh, not to be too lost in the world of romance as we keep singing our way through this theme rooted in love. Marvin Gaye raised this to a new level, a social level, a systemic level when he pointed out the poverty of love in our society, particularly in the 60s and 70s, and the call by Gay, Marvin Gaye, that its renewal, our renewal as a society that was fair and just and whole, that the only path to a redeemed and healed social future was in asking the question, what's going on? And in responding with love. Can you hear him? Mother, mother, there's too many of us crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. He goes on, Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. You see, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. In and out of the church, the song traditions of the human family deal with matters of love one-on-one -on -one and at a social and systemic level that we must take seriously. They speak to that which we yearn for the most and that which we need the most. Indeed, we begin our lives rooted in love because we are created out of God's love. But our rootedness, your theme, y'all, gets tested all the time. Even for those of us of Christian faith, that which is rooted must always struggle to stay rooted because if you take the botanical viewpoint or the agrarian viewpoint, that which is rooted in the plant world is always subject to the vicissitudes of wind and water and drought and scorch. And in our personal lives, we refer to this inability to keep faith with love, dare I say, to be uprooted <laughs> as our own human sinfulness. And it is true also at a social and systemic level, whether we are struggling with the temptation to be other than loving in our personal or our societal relationships, when we are wrestling with systemic evil, may I say to you, the call to us as the followers of Jesus Christ is to always let all of our thoughts, all of our actions, all of our responses be shaped by the love of God that we have seen in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I did not say that it was easy. And I'm abundantly aware that sometimes victims and abused parties are the ones that feel like the burden of mercy, grace, forgiveness, and love is on them. But for us in Christ, at the foot of the cross, the call to live our way into love, even as we dismantle the isms and the evils of our age, it must be rooted and grounded in love. Let me say it even more strongly. You and I are never released, even when we've gone astray and felt ourselves uprooted from the call and the command to love. We may excuse ourselves by saying, well, we're only human. 
But I stopped by to tell you we never get a pass on love. It is not as though God's commandment to love God, neighbor, and self is not a directive. It is not a suggestion that says to us, listen, Greg, love only if and when convenient. Oh, but I'm fighting evil. Well, I may be in a fight, but Paul said to the Corinthians in the second correspondence, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. No, the call of God to love is for all times and for all situations, no matter how difficult. We will fail. We have failed. The call to love does not go away. Our personal relationships should never be cheapened or commodified, and we should not walk away from them acting as if love is not the calling claim upon our lives, no matter the hurt we feel. Because of love, we must always be answering the question of who are our neighbors and responding out of the heart of Jesus and seeing all of those around us through the eyes of Jesus. We must fight against being sucked into love and law arguments as if we can compartmentalize our lives that neatly and cleanly. No, we must fight to love, and we must fight for love. Because hate, enmity, strife, alienation, and indifference. See, sometimes we, we, we act like we're not hating on each other. We're just being cool and indifferent. No, even indifference is too costly to the human spirit and to the reign of God and to the witness of the church. And as Dr. King and others have said, only love can drive out hate. As Marvin Gaye says, only love conquers hate. Perhaps this struggle is why forgiveness and reconciliation are so hard. The hurt has sometimes personally or systemically and socially been so deep and it has gone on for so long that we, we don't know where to dig in to begin, where to pick up. It just seems easier to keep on hating or being indifferent or living apart or living unreconciled with the people around us. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, whose death last year I still mourn, <laughs> had been chief rabbi of his part of the Jewish world in England for over 20 years. In a volume that I go back and read portions of every year, entitled The Dignity of Difference, How to Avoid the Clash of Civilizations, tells a story near the end of the book about Laura Blumenfeld, who has her own book about revenge and its limitations. Laura is a young Jewish woman at the time of this incident that Sachs recounts whose father was shot in the old city in Jerusalem in 1986 by a Palestinian terrorist. She went on to become a, a, a journalist. Her father was not killed, though his life obviously was changed and the life of his family was changed. As a part of her own search for healing and hope and a new future, which was laced with tones of revenge, in her journalistic career, she ended up in the Middle East and she befriended the family of the gunman who had shot her father in the old city. And she even began a correspondence with the terrorist who himself was imprisoned. She visited with the family and they did not know who she was. She had not disclosed that. She treated it as if she was just writing a story and she recited any number of incidences in which they or other members of the Palestinian community might have been involved. And the shooter's father tried to explain that it was the duty out of rectifying a painful history that his son or son's actions were what they were. 
She goes on to testify at the trial, having heard even the shooter's brothers say, this was just my brother's duty. It was nothing personal. And while she was on the stand testifying at Omar's trial, he has a name eventually. Her goal was to help this family and the whole world see that it may not be personal to them, but it was personal to her. That was her father. That was her dad. That was her past. And she was his future. As she's testifying at the trial, her mother stands in the back of the courtroom. At first, Laura does not know it's her. Just a voice that blurts out, I forgive Omar for what he did. And then she continues, and it is time for the state of Israel to forgive him. Laura is flustered, flabbergasted, when she realizes that not only this unwelcome word to live into forgiveness is being spoken at all, but that it's coming from her own mother. But they get through it, and Laura and her mother walk out of the courtroom, embracing and holding each other in tears, and then Omar's family follows them, and there are words of healing, hope, and reconciliation. There is some embrace of biblical proportions if you read some of the stories of reconciliation, especially in the book of Genesis. And then this note comes from Omar, the gunman, to Laura, who says, we have been in a state of war, and now we are passing through a new stage of historical reconciliation where there is no place for hatred and detestation. Rabbi Sachs goes on to comment after he narrates this journey of the Blumenfeld family. And I quote now, love is more than a possession. It is a part of the ability to let go and without it we kill what we most love. Every act of forgiveness, he continues, mends something broken in this fractured world. The call to love is always a call to heal. It is not a therapy thing. It is not only about roses and flowers and hugs and kisses and embraces among family members or friends and neighbors. Love is about acting out and living in to the healing of broken relationships. And so I ask of you hearing this narrative and thinking about your own theme, how might any of this speak to a fractured United Methodist Church? How might acts of healing and reconciliation Help us as United Methodists, you in the North Texas Conference, me in the West Ohio Conference, us in the general and jurisdictional and central conferences, how might this recollection that we are called to love at all times, which sometimes means the hard work of healing and redemption and forgiveness, how might we truly conference or confer together through the lenses of love and healing and, dare I say, hope. As I prepare to close, I'm struck by a verse of Scripture that I am not aware that I had paid attention to until I was about 19 years old. I was at a Sunday evening service at Cynthia, my wife's home church in South Philadelphia, and they were having a series of Sunday evening Lenten services. You know the drill. A preacher came from a neighboring church. He pulled a little black New Testament out of his pocket. I don't even know how he read it. The print was so small that I couldn't have read it when I was 19 years old. He opened that New Testament and he turned to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. And he read one verse. And here is a portion of the verse 
Remember now, the background is Passover is coming. Jesus is getting ready for the festival along with others. And hear this portion of John 13, 1. It references Jesus. It's the, the narrator's commentary, the gospel writer's telling of it. And he says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Let me say it one more time, North Texas. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I told you that love, healing, forgiveness, redemption, and hope were sometimes hard work. They were not the thing of chocolates and roses only. They were not the thing of going along to get along. They were the thing of truth-telling and of accountability, but truth-telling and accountability that was not intended to cancel you, but intended to call you in to a new, healed, and redeemed, and truthful relationship. I need to tell you, I hate, I hate, God help me, I hate the idea of the cancel culture because I'm absolutely persuaded that the mindset, the philosophy, the theology, if there is one, of a cancel culture is that there is no redemption. A cancel culture ends up in, uh, in war that is unrestricted where we go into the Colosseum and somebody ultimately dies, but he who stands or she who conquers today will have their own head cut off in the future. A cancel culture cuts off redemption and allows us to be sucked into a culture where we impose the death penalty and impose it with a great unevenness. I could go on and on and on, and I'm back to John 13 and 1, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And that's the kind of love you and I have been called who do you love all the way to the end? And for whom would you go to the lengths that Jesus of Nazareth went because of his love for us and he was acting out the heart of the love of God who I said to you earlier, whose love was so unrelenting that it chases us down and keeps giving us altar call after altar call, invitation after invitation. And so I close with a song. I began with a song. I can't stop from singing about this love thing. I'm a Wesleyan after all. And can't you hear Charles Wesley saying, love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth, come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling. This is an ongoing project of love. Fix in us thy humble dwelling. A dwelling is something that you build from the ground up. It's got to be rooted. It's got to be anchored. It's got to be fixed. And Wesley goes on, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, but not just, not just me. Enter every trembling heart. I told you, if you start exegeting these hymns and these songs, you'll get religion right tonight. But then we come to that closing verse. I love it. Where Wesley says, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Saints, I came by to tell you when love is hard, it's tough, and when you don't feel like it, maybe you just ought to send up a shaft of prayer and say, Master, finish thy new creation. Finish thy new creation. I'm not all that I ought to be. I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not yet all that I ought to be. God is not through with me, with you, with the church yet. Finish thy new creation. 
pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee. Watch this now. Lost in wonder. Lost in love. And lost in praise. It was love in the beginning. It's love all the way through, despite our derelictions and delinquencies, and it will be love that will bring us safely in. In the name of God who creates, who redeems, and who sanctifies the church and the world. Amen. To Bishop. Good evening. Good evening. Am I on? Okay. Thank you. Well, wow, I knew I was following the sermon, and I had no idea we were following that sermon, and gosh, <laughs> oh, I feel like we should be singing right now about love, but I am honored to be here. Um, thank you so much to the conference for letting us share the story of Project Transformation tonight. I'm Kirsten James. I'm the executive director of Project Transformation North Texas, and with me is Shirley Ramirez, one of our PT Corps members, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about us in a minute. And as many of you know, Project Transformation was founded 23 years ago as a mission of this conference out of the United Methodist Church of North Texas. And our mission is to transform communities by engaging children, college-age young adults, in churches, in purposeful relationships. And we envision a world that is rooted in love, pursues the equity of all people, and amplifies God's call on every voice. And we do this mission through free after-school and summer programs in churches and underserved communities with college-age young adults doing the program themselves and discerning their vocation and what they want to do in life. So our summer program started two weeks ago, kind of with after-school, and then we start full-day camps in two weeks. And this summer, it is more important than ever with the educational challenges, the social isolation, brought on by the um, pandemic, by COVID-19. And so now I'm gonna let Shirley tell you a little bit about what it was like for her growing up in Project Transformation, and now this summer as the site coordinator at Walnut Hill United Methodist Church. Good evening, North Texas Conference. As uh, Kirsten has introduced me as, I am the site coordinator of Walnut Hill this summer. Um, well, in a few words, I will try to describe my whole experience in PT so far. I've grown up in the program since I was 12 years old. I'm currently 20 years old, so I've been in this program for quite some time. And to say the least, um, it's transformed me, like the name Project Transformation. It does really change your life. Being in this program since that young of an age has actually helped me so much. It's put me, like, it's helped me through such hard times in my life as well. Going into this program at first, it was just, I thought it was just a regular old summer program. And I thought it was just there just to get away from home for a little bit and just enjoy the day. But as like time went on, I found that it is really just like a big family that you do make there, especially with all the friends that you meet from all over Texas and all over national. And now that I get to work with so many new people, especially some of my friends that I work with now, they're from all over uh, the United States. And it's amazing. It's so great that this is such a great opportunity for all of us, especially through all of the ages. Um, kids and college age adults and especially our volunteers that help us so much with our reading program and the kids love that. The kids adore having somebody to read with since they just love that attention and just it just helps so much to have people around and to help change this community and it's been such an amazing time and I hope I get to work with it for more years. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you for all your contributions to Project Transformation. And Shirley is at University of Texas of Arlington, an education major. And hopefully some of you will be volunteering this summer, and we may see you out at one of our site churches. 
And so now, if you will join me in prayer. God of all bounty and blessings, the gifts we offer you are like seeds. Some will take root nearby and we will see them grow and bear fruit. Some will be carried far beyond where we can see and we have faith that they will find good soil and thrive. We thank you for the privilege of being called to sow. Blessed with the joy of good fruit, the seed that we will see and the seed we will never see. And we pray this in the loving name of Jesus, Jesus, gardener and savior, amen. Thank you so much for your offering today. For those here in person, there are baskets at the back. And if you are online, there is a link on the live stream page. And as Shirley said, we thank all of you who have already donated so much to Project Transformation North, North Texas with your time, your treasure, and your talents. Thank you so much. Oh, dear. 
please stand as you are able for our closing hymn. It has been good to worship together in this place and virtually. I remind everyone that we begin tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning, and so I look forward to being with you then and to remind you that tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock is the service of commissioning and ordination in which we will commission uh, those who are provisional candidates for ministry and ordain deacons and elders. All are welcome to come and be present here in the sanctuary at St. Andrew United Methodist Church tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. Will you receive this benediction? <laughs> oh God, may we bear the love of Christ in this world so that each stranger we meet may find in us generous friends. And now we leave this place with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of our God, and the community and communion of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Amen.